Welcome to this uh, another edition of uh, View on Africa. Uh, my name is Martin Ewe. I'm a senior researcher uh, with the Transnational Threat and International Crime Division here at the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking at the law resistant army. Uh, just to remind you that uh, this year makes the 30th year of uh, the law resistant army since it was created in 1986, uh, formerly as the, uh, um, the spirit uh, of the, the spirit movement, which was created by Alice uh, Lekwane. Uh, the presentation uh, will basically uh, look at, uh, I think I have just 15 minutes to really brush over the presentation, then probably we can have more time for discussion. Uh, but what I intend to do uh, this morning is to uh, look at uh, first uh, the, uh, the update on the law resistant army, where we are with it, and then we'll look at the AU response, uh, and then quickly look at uh, in a little bit of more details, the regional coordination initiative that was created to eliminate the law resistant army. And then we'll look at uh, some of uh, the successes and of course the challenges uh, confronting the AU attempt to eliminate the law resistant army. Uh, the objectives of this presentation, uh, as I've said, uh, is to really assess the AU uh, response to the law resistant army in order really to uh, come up with some recommendations for the way forward. I don't think we want to live another 30 years of the law resistance army. So we need to find solutions. And I think this presentation will try to shed light on some of them. Um, again, as I said, the, the law resistant army was created uh, in 1986 when the so-called Alice uh, Laquena Laquena, which was a name uh, from a, uh, an Italian soldier who was killed uh, in uh, Uganda during a war where he was fighting. Um, and uh, the word in uh, actually Akoli, which is the tribe in northern Uganda where Alice uh, Lekwane and uh, Joseph Kone, as we'll come to see, come from. Uh, Lekwane means messenger. So it's like the messenger of the spirit. Uh, so Alice uh, always saw herself as a messenger of the spirit, and uh, at some point she was crowned the, uh, a prophet uh, in northern Uganda because of her role in trying to liberate the Akoli people. Uh, so she created the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the spirit movement in 1986, which was basically a movement to um, uh, reinstate the uh, the honor or the, the glory of the Akoli uh, people uh, in uh, northern Uganda. Um, so she believed that uh, she had the powers, the spiritual powers, or that the spirit were in her, and she was the messenger to deliver the spirit. Uh, so she gathered some men and uh, started uh, this uh, insurgency uh, in 1986. But she was eventually defeated by the uh, Ugandan forces uh, in 1987, uh, actually in November 1987, and she had to um, to escape. She fled actually to Kenya, where she lived in a refugee camp uh, until her death in 2007. Uh, then came, of course, the Joseph Kony, uh, the one who remains at large since uh, he took over uh, the movement. Uh, in uh, 1987 and renamed it the Law Resistant Army. It went through a number of transitions, a number of names, uh, but given time, uh, we can't really go into any much details. But Joseph Kony is the founder of the Law Resistant Army, uh, which began operation immediately after Alice uh, fled to Kenya. So he uh, uh, started the revolution because he himself also believed that uh, he had uh, the spirit, that he was having spiritual attacks. And therefore, as a cousin of Alice, I think he uh, saw himself as the right head to uh, her revolution, which she had actually thought uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was finished uh, after she was defeated by the Ugandan forces. So <clears throat> since then, uh, Connie uh, has... Uh, led a very fierce and ferocious 
uh, uh, movement, uh, which, uh, as uh, we'll come to see, has caused heavy atrocities uh, in Uganda that uh, most often uh, one cannot really quantify in terms of uh, figures. Uh, but uh, Joseph Kony uh, has done a lot of uh, recruitment uh, to the extent that at some point he had over 20,000 uh, 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 troops or forces uh, that were fighting for him uh, between uh, 1987 and 2006, uh, which is often regarded as the peak period of the Lord Resistance Army. Just uh, for us to to look at the earlier, uh, the earlier uh, in a brief, um, to give you a brief overview of where we are. Um, again, this group is responsible for the death of over 100,000 people. Uh, this estimate uh, was made actually in uh, 2012, 2013. So the figures could be way higher uh, today. But uh, since then, uh, you know, um, the movement has not been as strong as it used to be. So uh, the deaths uh, have been very, very small uh, for the past uh, three years or so. Uh, but it is also uh, the UN estimated that uh, in 2013, actually, um, that uh, LRA could have uh, between 300 and 500 uh, active uh, fighters. Uh, and that's by 2013 uh, or between 1987 and 2006 that it was responsible for 1.9 million IDPs, uh, which were uh, somewhere in between Uganda and Kenya. So they were all over uh, the place. Uh, and then of course, uh, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, that the peak period of the LRA was uh, between 1987 and 2006. Uh, what I tried to show here was uh, some of the areas where the LRA has been very active and the countries that uh, have uh, really uh, witnessed some of uh, the impact of the group. Uh, you can see South Sudan where, you know, about 49,000 uh, people have been displaced. Uh, you can see Central African Republic where 21,000 uh, and uh, the Democratic Republic uh, of Congo, uh, where 255,000 have been uh, displaced. So after Uganda, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo is where the LRA activities have had a heavy impact. The, we, we're witnessing uh, what uh, some have referred to as the resurgence of the LRA. Uh, this is because of a number of uh, increasing or the increase in attacks uh, in the past uh, year or so. Uh, just to give you a brief figure in terms of uh, where we are between this year and last year. Uh, now, the year is often calculated from last year. If you, you can see that between 2014 and 2015, um, the LRA uh, uh, adopted uh, one, uh, 662 people, uh, many of which were children or youth uh, between the ages of 14 uh, and 18. And uh, 100, it committed 198 attacks, uh, and uh, in those attacks, 14 people were killed. Uh, but if you see this year, uh, we've had a huge uh, increase uh, where 200 attacks have been carried out uh, and in those 200 attacks, they have been able to adopt uh, 679 uh, 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 people. Uh, again, many of them uh, being children. And then uh, the death uh, rate for this year has uh, only been uh, 19, but it is still higher than last year. But what we see is that this increase in number of attacks, we are only in June. Uh, you know, uh, so and to, to, to have 200, it means that if the LRA were to continue the activities, uh, given the rate that they've started this year, we could have uh, a huge uh, year for them, uh, you know, which could signal that the, the group is back uh, to full strength or to something that we knew before 2012. Um, the uh, latest attack uh, occurred on the 26th of uh, June, uh, which was uh, on Sunday, uh, when uh, five LRA fighters ambushed a trader in Central African Republic, um, killing him and then looting uh, his stuff. Um, then we also have a major attack this year, which uh, actually took place on the 13th uh, of June. Um, again, this one was in Ka, in Kajama, uh, where, you know, they attack uh, civilian looting uh, food and non-food uh, items. 
just very quickly in terms of their tactics uh, over the years, uh, you know, ambush or raid uh, have been very consistent, uh, which, you know, Northern Uganda, they know a lot about this. I mean, this is a fear tactic. It's a tactic of intimidation because they often take their uh, enemy by surprise. Uh, then we've also had some very disturbing uh, tactics where they've been uh, using dismemberment of uh, or beheading of people, uh, where they chop off part of their bodies, uh, could be limbs, could be the, uh, the arms, and so on. And of course, we've been having, uh, if you, you see many people in northern Uganda or where the LRA has had heavy impact, many people with disfigured uh, bodies, you know, where uh, the LRA has had. Uh, noses, lips, uh, ears, and limbs. Uh, you know, the adoptions have been their major tactic because they use it for recruitment. Uh, they, they use it to terrorize uh, communities. We've also had incidents where, you know, the LRA is uh, daring to confront security forces face to face in a shootout. Uh, they've used incendiary also uh, in northern Uganda, especially where they've been able to burn down villages. Uh, in some part of southern Sudan, they did that also, and in uh, the uh, Central African Republic, uh, part of uh, Congo, where uh, you know they've been able to burn houses or burn down villages uh, in some cases. Uh, rape has also been a constant tactic of the group. They will ambush their uh, uh, their victims normally in the forest. Uh, and rape them, um, mutilate them, and uh, rob them. So arm robbery, all sort of uh, vandalism, uh, have been uh, key strategies of uh, the LRA. Um, in terms of, uh, just to give you a quick overview of, uh, you know, the trend uh, to show you, you know, uh, where we are going, how the, the LRA is progressing, which you can also use to measure uh, whether is it uh, getting stronger, is it declining, or what's happening with the LRA. You see that 2010, as you look at uh, the, uh, the chart here, uh, which uh, comes from the Resolve LRA Crisis Initiative. Uh, you see that 2010 uh, remains the, the peak, uh, particularly when you are looking at the past uh, five years. We've already said that the peak period of the LRA was between uh, 1987 and 2006. Uh, but if you leave that period between 2010 and 2016, uh, really, 2010 remains the peak where you know they carry out um, over uh, uh, um, or nearly 500 uh, attacks. Uh, and in those 500 attacks, uh, there were heavy uh, casualties. We had up to 780 people uh, death, uh, and adoptions were also extremely high, uh, reaching uh, nearly 1,500. So you can see that 2010 um, was really when the group was extremely active. And then their activities fell drastically uh, um, in 2011, uh, continued to fall in 2012, uh, 2013, which uh, recorded the lowest in terms of attacks. <clears throat> uh, but in terms of uh, uh, death, uh, 2014 uh, recorded the lowest uh, with about two uh, deaths or so. Um, but if you look at adoptions, you can see that, you know, um, even though we had a fall uh, in 2011, uh, but the number was still very significant, where we had up to 600 uh, adoptions. And then the number falls slightly again in 2012 and 2013. And in 2014, we began to see a rise in adoptions and kidnappings by the LRA. This chart here attempts to give you the kind of quarterly trends, the report. Again, uh, the, the Resolve uh, LRA Crisis Initiative is doing an excellent job in monitoring uh, what is going on with the group and its activities. So you can see here the quarterly report from the Resolve uh, um, LRA Crisis uh, Initiative. Um, it shows that, again, 2010 was high. Uh, and if you look in terms of uh, years, you see that um, you know we had more attacks in 2010. 2011 followed. And 2013, there was a drop. Uh, 2014 uh, remained uh, somehow uh, stable. Now, let's look, look very quickly at the AU response. Uh, again, the AU response uh, goes back to 20, 
2013, uh, 2003, sorry, when actually Uganda uh, sent a letter to the African Union requesting uh, the AU to, to brand the LRA as a terrorist group. Um, the AU really did not uh, provide any response uh, to that letter, uh, but it was only in 2012 that the AU actually adopted a decision through its Peace and Security Council, uh, which uh, branded or labeled the LRA as a terrorist group. Uh, now, that was an important decision because uh, it means that the LRA around the continent uh, is a terrorist group. It removed uh, several ambiguities surrounding the group where many people saw it as a legitimate uh, rebel group uh, which was fighting for the uh, liberation of the Akoli people in northern Uganda. Uh, but as a terrorist group, you know, the perception uh, has to change. Uh, now, the, the AU also established uh, the Regional Coordination Initiative, which we're going to look at a little bit in more details, uh, particularly when we look at the Regional uh, Task Force, which has been the AU military response to the Lord Resistant Army. Now, the, 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 the difference here is that the Regional Coordination Initiative is really a political mechanism, uh, while the uh, ROTF is a military wing of that uh, political uh, response. Now, the AU has uh, also utilized uh, its uh, status uh, as a continental uh, pan-African body to mobilize uh, uh, diplomatic, political, military, and financial support uh, for the fight against the uh, Lord Resistant Army. Now, we must have to preface the AU response, particularly when we are looking at the, the RCI, uh, the initiative to eliminate the law resistant army to say that um, the, what the AU did was basically to bring uh, 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 parts which were already working together, uh, but there was not enough coordination. So what the RCI initiative or the RCI uh, actually did was to reinforce that uh, coordination that was lacking among the countries. But the countries were already very active in terms of combating uh, the Lord resistant army. Uh, but coordination was lacking. And we have to also understand that the coordination was lacking because the LRA has been part of um, what I call the balance of power in East Africa, where some countries actually sponsored uh, the LRA in order to increase their bargaining power in within the region. Uh, it's not time to really call names because we want to promote a cooperative uh, endeavor for all the countries that are responsible to work together. But we know that there have been countries uh, and countries in the region are known for sponsoring uh, uh, proxy groups uh, in other countries in order uh, to support either certain ethnic groups or to increase their bargaining uh, power. And of course, the LRA also was utilized by some of the countries. And therefore, there was really mistrust, uh, high mistrust among the countries in terms of how to uh, uh, combat the LRA. And of course, for a long time, it was left to uh, uh, Uganda alone to fight the group until when the group started, uh, you know, stretching its, its legs, its tentacles to other countries within the region, particularly the uh, uh, Central African Republic, um, Southern Sudan, uh, and the DRC. Um, so uh, again, these countries were forced to join the initiative to fight uh, the group. So the AU has really helped, um, you know, through the establishment of uh, the ROTF, uh, which is the military uh, um, wing of uh, the RCI. Now you can see the countries, uh, pr the principal countries that um, form uh, uh, part of the uh, ROTF, uh, the troop contributing countries. We have uh, the Central African Republic, we have South Sudan, uh, each of which has uh, um, contributed 500 troops. Uh, then we have Uganda, which has contributed uh, 2,000 troops or 40% of uh, the troops level, and the DRC uh, Congo, which uh, has also contributed uh, a similar amount uh, um, uh, as uh, South Sudan and uh, CAR. Now, the, 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 the key here is that um, the troops level, which was uh, um, actually estimated to be 5,000, was attained uh, in 2013, 2014. Uh, but since then, you know, the fight against uh, the LRA has um, demonstrated that this is a huge, vast region 
uh, that you know, 5,000 troops cannot really cover the whole region uh, if they were to achieve the objectives of uh, the RTF. Um, the headquarters of the uh, uh, RTF is in South Sudan, where it has been since uh, its uh, establishment in 2012. Now, in 2013, uh, the RTF launched uh, a very important operation, uh, which was codenamed uh, uh, Operation Monsoon, uh, which uh, has actually been the operation that has been able to, um, uh, uh, to achieve many of the successes uh, that we can talk about today, particularly in uh, um, heating or eliminating key commanders of the Lord Resistance Army. Uh, Basically, if we can look at uh, some of its success, we will say that uh, Joseph Kony is basically isolated from uh, the key commanders that it used to have. Though we know that uh, they have also been recruiting uh, through uh, uh, these huge uh, kidnapping and uh, uh, adoptions that they have carried out in recent years. For example, we mentioned that over 660 uh, kidnappings or uh, um, uh, adoptions were carried out in 2014 and 2015. And this year we are already uh, looking at 679 adoptions. What do they do with these people? They actually turn them into soldiers. They turn some of them into uh, uh, um, sex slaves, especially the young girls. Uh, some of them do house chores. Some of them, uh, you know, carry uh, weapons. Uh, and some of them are used also for intelligence. Uh, so they, they use uh, these uh, young kids for a lot of uh, uh, other activities uh, of the group. The areas of operation, uh, which I've already mentioned, again, uh, the areas of operations are the same, uh, almost similar to uh, the areas of uh, um, the law resistant army where they've had uh, many of the activities concentrated. Uh, you can see CAR, uh, the Central African Republic, where you know uh, many of the activities uh, have been centered on, um, especially in 2014. Now, uh, the, the key challenge, as we'll come to see, uh, um, is that where, what determines whether the LRA activities should be concentrated in South Sudan or in Central African Republic or in the DRC? It's actually based on instability. Now they look at the country that is most unstable and then they carry out a lot of the activities because there it is a lot more easier for them to operate because security forces are now focused on other areas. Um, to uh, wrap up, um, let's just look at uh, some of the successes. Again, I've talked about effective coordination of the group uh, of the RTF. Uh, they, they've been able to bring the countries together. Now, this was key because there is no way you can defeat the LRA uh, without, uh, you know, the uh, the coordination of uh, the countries within the region, uh, which is also essential because. You know, many of these, some of these countries were those that were providing uh, the LRA its resources. So if they are not against the LRA, it will help to actually suppress and deprive the group of some of its key resource uh, resources, uh, particularly when it comes to weapons, when it comes to finances, which are used to finance its activities. So um, coordination of the countries in the region is extremely important. Um, for eliminating the LRA. And of course, there have been significant scale down of LRA activities. Um, I think if you look at the kind of attacks that they've carried out, apart from the abductions that they have uh, um, been doing heavily, many of the attacks are really for survivors uh, uh, tactics. Uh, you know, the, the attacks are carried out uh, for the purpose of gathering food uh, or for the purpose of uh, um, uh, getting key uh, materials such as communication, it could be mobile phones or other things that they need uh, for them to survive uh, in the forest. So it has not really been attacks for attack's sake, but really attacks for survival. And then of course, uh, all the top commanders, uh, uh, many of them, I think 90% have been eliminated. We have one now in The Hague, uh, uh, Ongwen, who is facing uh, uh, trial. He has also, he actually has been accused, uh, he has seven, uh, 70 counts of accused, which he has to 
answer for, and we hope that, uh, you know, um, uh, following his uh, judgment, the um, ICC will be able to pass judgment. Uh, of course, uh, this follows uh, the, the fact that the LRA has been in the radar of um, the ICC since 2003, when uh, the Ugandan government um, uh, brought the issue to the ICC. And of course, Joseph Kone was indicted in 2007, uh, 2008, um, there was some kind of dialogue that uh, never materialized because he failed uh, to show up. Uh, this was not the first time. Uh, many attempts, 2005, where you know there was an attempt to negotiate the issue of the law resistant army. Um, uh, uh, Joseph Kony again uh, failed to show up. And in many of these cases, he will kill the commanders uh, that were involved, that he himself actually sent to go and represent him in these talks. Uh, but once the talks uh, fail, he will kill them and uh, to close uh, the chapters. We've also had a lot of surrenders from uh, um, the law resistant army, which is why we are thinking that they've really been significantly scaled down. They've really been significantly reduced to the extent that they don't pose that major threat that they used to pose, uh, particularly in the years before 2010. Uh, and even since then, we can uh, really uh, say the LRA can uh, attack all of these countries. They will attack, of course, for survival strategy, as I've said, uh, but really attacks for attacks sake that we used to see um, are not significantly uh, reduced. Now, uh, we can wrap up uh, without uh, looking at um, uh, some of the challenges uh, I've said. Uh, now, what is going on within the uh, ROTF is that um, there is the cry of uh, the need for more troops, uh, most people will argue that probably do we really need, because what the RTF is supposed to be, is supposed to be like a specialized tax force, uh, which you don't need millions of people to do it. You don't need thousands. You need just a small number, which is well-trained and well-equipped. Uh, and that's why it is sometimes controversial. The argument that, you know, the shortage of troops uh, is a big problem and that you need more troops, um, you know, to really comb the whole of uh, the areas that the LRA operate. Uh, but again, uh, you know, um, it's debatable. I think that if you equip these people very well, you beef up the intelligence very well, um, I'm sure you will not need that many number of troops. Uh, we've also have shortage uh, of resources. This has been very, very serious, where salaries are not paid, the AU has not demonstrated enough resources to top, uh, uh, the, uh, to top up uh, the responsibilities of the uh, RTF. And that is really uh, frustrating many uh, people uh, and many of the countries because the, the lack of resources has led to Uganda threatening to withdraw its uh, forces. Now, if Uganda were to withdraw its forces, this could be a significant blow or even a deadly blow to the ROTF because Uganda plays a major role. It's the country with the highest number of troops. It's the country that has been the most active in the fight against uh, the law resistant army. And if Uganda were to give up, I think uh, Joseph Kone could go back to Northern Uganda where it will, he will continue to where he has left off. We don't want that to happen. So Uganda uh, has to remain. The AU has to do everything to make sure that Uganda uh, remains on board and to uh, reinforce uh, you know, the ROTF so that um, they can really carry out their activities well. I think that the ROTF model should be based on intelligence. There is no way you can fight Joseph Kony uh, without intelligence. And what the force should do, I think it should be dedicated to eliminating Joseph Kony, which means that there should be a special tax force, well-trained, well-equipped with the best intelligence uh, to really track down Joseph Kony and uh, you know, plan for a rapid response in order to eliminate him. Because with the elimination of Joseph Kony, I think that the LRA uh, will be done. Uh, will not longer hear the LRA will, will be a thing of the past. I thank you very much.